Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 39 of Inking Out Loud. We're going to be wrapping up our read of The Fires of Heaven today, book 5 of Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time. I'm your host, Rob Santos, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Drew McCaffrey. How's it going, everybody? And again, we have returning special guest, Patrick McCaffrey, our sound engineer. Pat, what's up, dude? Hey, guys. Now, you I'm two. I'm sorry. What? Why, why are you sorry? Why apologize? <laughs> Inflicting my presence on we the podcast. We love having again. your presence on the podcast, Pat. We can't get enough of you. Now, let's up spears, don our killing veils, and dive through that gateway to kill one of the shadow sold. Drew, Hell my man, yeah. take it away. Recap us what we read last week. Uh, yeah. Well, we left off uh, last week right before a mega showdown between the Aiel who support Rand and the Shido. And in the wings waiting were four more clans of the Aiel who had been uh, thus far neutral. And uh, man, we we get a great battle sequence over the next couple of chapters uh, with Rand and uh, and his lady channelers, Egwene and Avienda, uh, throwing lightning bolts around and burning the trees off of hills and all this stuff. And meanwhile... Matt decides uh, he's out. He's like, I'm, I'm getting away. I'm not going to get involved. And of course he got involved. And, uh, <laughs> and he saved a huge column of uh, Terran and Kyrianan soldiers from a Shido ambush. And part of the deal was uh, he has to lead them in battle if they're going to listen to him. So he does that. And Matt ends up killing Kooladin. The... Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, and uh, so they win. They they disperse the Shido. The remaining four clans join with Rand. They move into the city of Kyrian itself. Uh, meanwhile, back at Val and Luca's traveling circus, uh, Nynaeve meets up with Masima, and they have a, a fun little showdown there. And they... Uh, Decide, hey, it's time to head out. They figure out they're going to Saladar. So they go to get on a ship. But during this time, riots happen in Samara. And Galad helps them fight their way through the riots in what is, uh, I think, a pretty awesome scene. Uh, they are joined on the ship by some interesting people, including Mogedian in disguise. They get to Saladar. And from there, we have our like real, real climax to the book where... Uh, Rand gets news in Kyrian that Morghese is dead. He decides, hey, it's time. We're going to Camelon. We're going to take down Robin. And as they're preparing for that, Lanfear shows up and uh, has a showdown with Rand. Moiraine tackles her through the gateway to the Eelfin, and it burns down, severing the bond with Lan and uh, leaving Rand without Moiraine. But he nonetheless moves on to Camelon. Matt and Avienda and Asmodian are killed. Rand kills Ravin with Balefire. Matt and Avienda and Asmodian come back to life. And meanwhile, Nynaeve has a showdown in Teleron Riyad with Magedian and captures her. And then, of course, uh, we have a you know, very brief epilogue. Uh, I don't think anything really important happens in it. I think some, some dude gets killed. Uh, but, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. What an some ending. Some dude gets killed for <laughs> Sooth. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I guess I'll kick us off with our style discussion there, because um, I want to talk about something that I don't think we've covered before, but it, at the same time, I do want to note that it wouldn't surprise me if we had. We were, you know, quite far into our episodes of The Wheel of Time, but I want to talk about Jordan's decision to make something as climactic and monumental as the killing of Kuladin to happen off screen, and also making it Matt, of all people, that ended up doing the deed. I want to get you guys' thoughts on that. What do you think? No, it was super cool that Matt was the one. Um... So I'm I'm really curious to see how the show treats this because I feel like they they're not going to be able to resist giving us an on screen showdown between Matt and Kooladin, You know? Yeah. Like, uh, but but in the book, I don't really have a problem with it. I do remember being uh, surprised and really thrown the first time I read it, where I was like. Whoa! Wait a second. What? Matt, what? Yeah. Like that's Kooladin's head. Like, exactly. That was my you know, reaction Because that too. whole that whole chapter starts with Matt avoiding looking at it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and uh, 
great chapter, by the way. Oh, yeah, it is. And <laughs> I think the that's best. the first time we get uh, Jack of the Shadows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have a, an issue with the way Robert Jordan did that because uh, I think it it was purposeful in the sense that he wanted to show just how um, insignificant Kooladin was. Kooladin was always a pawn. He wasn't a proper antagonist because he didn't really have his own agency. He was a pawn of Asmodian and he was a pawn of Savannah. Yeah. And so like, why spend the time and space to show us his death when it's like in the grand scheme of things, not that big a deal. You know, I agree. For, uh, He's for like a mini boss. The most mini boss yeah. is a, an appropriate opponent for Matt. Yeah, sure. Sure, for for one of the Lord Dragon's right hand men mm -hmm. to uh, test himself, but, right? Oh, of course. But then you know. again, from like a narrative perspective, there, what what's important for Matt during this battle is his decision to lead them and and to be a strategist and to show the fact that he has these memories and and this skill as a battle tactician. We already know Matt's a badass with you know, uh, the quarterstaff yeah. or his Ashan Durai. We don't need to see Matt fight another dude with the Ashan Durai, you know? So the important stuff with Matt, we get covered. Yeah. And and then other than that, we have to deal with the important things with Rand. So there, you know, it, it would have been essentially bloat if he had written a scene, a fight scene between uh, Matt and Kuladin. Yeah. Um, I'll say that I thought the decision to kill Kuladin off screen... I think I've been saying it two different ways this episode. Kuladin, Kuladin. I'm just going to decide right now. I'm going to say Kuladin. I thought it was ballsy because something like this would have been, I think, if you, uh, being in his shoes, if I can put myself there temporarily and think about how easy it would have been to kind of end the entire Kuladin threat with Book 5 and having Kuladin be like, you know, the big personal conflict for Rain that gets resolved. But, you know, Jordan just shows us that he really doesn't have time to fuck around. Because he just killed Kuladin pretty early in this narrative. Well, all things considered. Um, so that he can get the ball rolling with Samael and especially Ravi. You know, like, as, as far as it happening off-screen goes, it confused me just like it confused you when I was a teenager, Drew, and I read it for the first time. I had the exact same reaction. It was like, wait, hold, wait, hold on, back up, 15 steps, what just happened? Matt? Matt? Of all people? Um, and I, 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 yeah. can, I can appreciate it now, like as, as you just said, Drew, you know, we have seen Matt be a complete, total badass with the Ashen Darai. We've seen him kick ass with the quarterstaff. We haven't really seen him flex his tactical muscles yet in, like, directing men and directing battle and showing off what he's achieved, um, or what he's gained, I should say, from his trip through the second Redstone uh, doorway. But I just, I, I guess my issue with it was just how offhanded of a, of a revelation it was. It wasn't even, like immediately after the fact and holy crap everybody's talking about the fact that matt did this it was just an offhand comment you know from one of the characters i can't remember who it was i, I want to say avienda um but it was just like so like oh and yeah this happened by the way that it just it was so so jarring especially to me as a young man i was like 13 years old reading this for the first time yeah so like as you're saying, when I was younger, it was jarring. But as I've, you know, developed as a writer and, and learned more about narrative pacing and, and character development, and things like that, I think this was extremely purposefully done. And I agree with the decision to do it this way. Because, like, as I was saying earlier, Kooladin was never supposed yeah, to be that's what you Rand's said, that big me. threat. Yeah. You know, like, and, and uh, in this book, Rand's big personal threat is Ravin. Well, so, it, He's not even considering Ravin for the 95% of this book, though. He's well, not even thinking but, about it. But Ravine. it's set up at the beginning with Ravin sending those dark hounds okay. to Roydia okay. in, like, what, chapter three. Yeah. And there are these little things pieced together throughout where we have the Forsaken Socials. So we know Ravin and Samael are uh, working together, and Lanfear is working with them, and Grandal is working with them, and everything is trying to set Rand up for this attack on Robin in Camelot. And this is, this is you know, uh, what we talked about a couple episodes ago, with dramatic irony. Uh, it doesn't matter that Rand isn't thinking about Robin because we're thinking about Robin. Mm. Yeah, we are, especially with the the added context of Morghese and her struggles to A, leave the, t leave the palace and B, right. collect followers. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so where, 
where Robin is Rand's like real personal antagonist in this book, uh, going forward, one of his big personal antagonists in the next book is going to be Savannah. And the fact that she is ultimately behind all of this with the Shido. Cooladin, yeah, he's a he's a hothead, he's ambitious, but he's being played by Savannah mm -hmm. this whole time. So it's more important that we see things develop with Savannah in the next book than it was for us to see Cooladin actually being killed but on the page in this book. Can you argue that Savannah has that much agency, though? I mean, herself? She, of course, you know, this would be a better discussion for book yeah. six, probably. Well, no, absolutely. In this book, Savannah is the reason right, but the Shido, you know... Are you saying there's nobody else kind of influencing her, manipulating her, pulling her not strings? At not moment. at this point, no. Not, not at, at this, this point, moment. no. It, it happens oh, yeah, okay. directly after this Fair battle. Enough. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so... I don't know. I, I like that decision uh, from a writer's perspective. I, I think it was really smart. I think it was a, a good thing to either cut. I don't know if he originally wrote it and his editor, if Harriet or you know whomever, told him, like, hey, we don't need this. Or if he, if Robert Jordan was aware of the fact and just never wrote this scene in the first place. But I think we're dealing with a pretty huge book to begin with here. Like, this is a, what, 360, 375,000 oh, yeah. word book. So if we if we threw in another 2,000 word scene uh, with this fight between Matt and Kooladin and the Shido, like, like yeah, it, it would have been fun, I'm sure, but we don't need it. And when we're dealing with a book this big, the things that you don't need, you have to be really aware of and... and willing to you know, kill your darlings so to speak yeah it's it's also part and parcel of the way that robert jordan handles large-scale battles as a general rule in the wheel of time this is our first large-scale battle to occur and what we don't see is this eye in the sky all-knowing strategic overview we get bits and pieces from all over the battlefield um and we don't so we we have a uh, an idea of what's going on in the grand scheme of things, yeah. but it's much more on the tactical level, and so a lot of things are skipped and left to our imagination, which is a great way to write battles, and yeah. what, which is, you know, this is why I wanted this is one of my favorite ones that he's done. Well, and we talked about this at the end of Shadow Rising too, mm -hmm. with the Battle of the Immense Field, where he gives us a, a limited point of view with Perrin, where if he had done a battle in that eye in the sky sort of style the tension of the Battle of Iman's Field would have been robbed because we would have known that the Devon Riders were coming and the Watch Hill Folk were there with Fayil. Like, but because it's in Perrin's <clears throat> limited perspective, we have this chaotic, very centralized viewpoint of the battle. Mm -hmm. You know, you we only know what's going on on one front of the Battle of Iman's Field. Right. You know. And, you know, in this battle, like... We hear almost nothing about what goes on with the good guy Aiel. Yeah, no. And it's uh, it's all from Matt's Matt's perspective as far as boots on the ground is concerned. Right, and then, and then and then with Rand's, you know, when he's like looking through the the telescopes and stuff like that, half the time he's saying he's like, I don't know whose Aiel those are. I just know they're Aiel. They might be Shido. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm really if glad you, you guys about... brought this up because this this is actually pretty much where I start my character points when I have with Randall Thor um, about this entire sure. battle and, and and what it means for his character and how it kind of you know changes how we come to think of him. But before we do that, I just want to make sure: is there anything else that you guys want to talk style oriented before we get into our characters? No, I'm all right. No, yeah, no. let's talk Randall Thor. Let's do it. Cool. Let's talk Randall Thor in context of. The chapter, this place, this day, that entire sequence. Um, mm -hmm. like, this is our first taste. I wrote down. This is our first taste of Rand acting more or less as a general. You know, yeah. it's our it's our first big setup, as you mentioned just a few minutes previously, Pat. It's our first big setup to a prepared battle because you know before this we've seen big battles, but you know, like the ending of the Great Hunt or the pandemonium uh, end of the eye of the world yeah the end that's of the, the, of the eye of the world in the exactly in the blight or the pandemonium in the heart of the stone at the end of the dragon reborn we have in the shadow rising we have the shadow spawn assault on the stone and we have the battle at al Dal yeah. at the end these are all you know these are conflagrations but this True, is different but 
sorry, go it's, ahead. It's an, order, it's an order of magnitude greater right. than all of the things that we've seen in the book Right, thus this far. is different because we've been chasing Kuladin from Roideon to the city of no. Kyrian itself, knowing that this would be the end. We've been prepared for this for, you know, quite a while. And, you know, seeing Rand finally getting the chance to like convene the leaders of battle like the like the Aiel clan chiefs or the tyrant and Kyrian and lords um and even to some extent women channelers with Egwene and Avienda it was not only incredibly badass but it gave us a different look at battle this time around it because we have time to stop and contemplate the gravity of what's about to happen yes and i and i liked that where uh we had those scenes with like Rand and Lannan as Modian and uh, and then Matt coming in, you know, and and going over the battle plan where Matt just like comes up with basically the same battle plan the Aiel Chiefs came up with in like ten seconds, right? And uh, <laughs> it, it so it gives us more of a sense of uh, like portent to this battle. I do agree with Pat. I like other than the Tarwin's Gap battle between the Shadow Spawn and the Shi'anarans at the beginning oh, yeah, of, or at the end of Eye of the World. Uh, this is the biggest battle we've seen because we're we're moving hundreds of thousands of warriors around yeah. at yeah. this battle on both sides on both sides, which yeah. is what makes it bigger than Tarwin's Gap. Well, because the the, the, the entire range. strength of Shi'anar was there, which they're was in the... they're they're in the six figures. I mean, the the Borderlander army. I thought they were outnumbered south. like ten to one at Tarwin's Gap at the beginning. Well, yeah, there were they like were. millions of Trollocs. Millions. I mean. I didn't think there was well, that well, so many. So think about this. Think about this. Rand like, they killed stripped, them all himself. Millions? They stripped the garrisons of of Shi'anar yeah. for that battle at Tarwin's Gap. They talk about this at, at Faldara. They stripped those garrisons. Later in the series, we're going to see a combined Borderlander army from all four nations of 400,000. I find that hard to believe because Shi'anar wasn't even a borderland for that long. Malkir was a borderland long before that. Well, like, but they were they they sent troops north into Malkir all the time. They talked about this. Mm. But the fact that we have a a, a hundred thousand Shi'anarans, a hundred thousand Kandori, a hundred thousand Arafelin, and a hundred thousand Saldeans in that combined borderlander army. The Kandori and the Arafelin, they were all there. I thought they were. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. Go the, ahead, finish your point. The combined borderlander army later in the series, all four rulers of the borderland nations come south. Elaine deals with them, remember, in Brainwood, yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, all four of the nations are there. It's 100,000 troops Holy from each of the borderlands. So there had to have been at least 100,000 Chianarans at Tarwin's Gap. Holy Probably shit. more, because they were getting wrecked. Like, they, they lost Damn, a lot there. I would have thought we were talking like but, 10 to 50. But that said, Holy though, crap. that said, though, we're looking at a, a totally different kind of battle here, mm, yes. and one where we see the preparation... And we see uh, personal stakes involved for the characters. Tarwin's gap at the end of Eye of the World is like Rand shows up for twenty seconds and like opens up the earth under a bunch of shadow spawn and yep. like throws like waves of rocks at them and then goes away, goes back into yep. like a dream shard, dream shard. and mm -hmm. and fights Ishamael. So in in this, there's so much more focus on the scale of battle you know it's it's more about like what battles are really like the the chaos yeah the confusion yeah and 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 i loved that little tidbit with rand looking through the telescope watching these columns of aiel moving around and, and he's got no idea who who's who yeah he's like do i attack them do i do i not are they yeah. shadow we, i i think got... they're shadow a you smaller know? taste of this kind of chaos of battle in the Shadow Rising, a more intimate taste of it in, in the Two Rivers with Golden right, Eyes, but, but much this smaller huge, scale. spectacular, much much amp like greater amplified uh, battle that we we see here. Though it just it 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 was it was pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie, it was definitely pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and and I liked how that has an impact on both Matt and Rand as characters, because. Rand, for instance, this is like one of his lowest points uh, in mm -hmm. his relationship with the maidens, right? Because yeah. he he goes, he's like seeing all the dead laid out, right? Yeah. Especially after like uh, when Samuel attacks the tower, and yeah, and like all the maidens are dead, and Rand has to to come to grips with this, and this is when he starts his list. That was where he started the list. I thought he started yeah. it because I have a, a point about Moiraine here. I thought he started that list with Moiraine. 
No, because he's he's going down and he's looking at the faces of the maidens as they're laid out. Next oh, to the tower. Th- did I I missed that detail? This this was the book where he was going around looking at the faces. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I missed that that detail this time around. I must have not been paying attention during that part of the audiobook. Yeah. So there's uh, like there there's like major character moments with Rand in this battle. Oh yeah. As well as with Matt. Um, and uh, is there anything else we want to talk about, Rand, yeah, before we move on to there's that? There's just uh, one more point, and it kind of follows along li- uh, yeah. nicely on the heels of what you just said there, Drew. I just wanted to reiterate that this has to be uh, to be one of the most pivotal books in the series in terms of how it shapes Randall Thor, uh, or at least the Randall Thor that we're going to see for the next six or seven books. We have the <clears throat> the first instances of Rand acknowledging Luz Theron, like Luz Theron's voice in his head. We have the... Uh, first inklings of the list of dead women that he blames himself for, as you just said, Drew. Um, And I I wrote down starting first and foremost with Moraine, but you raised a good point there. Um, We have Rand starting to grapple with his feelings about not being able to hurt women, even those that threaten him and everything he stands for, even when it costs him dearly. You know, like, The Fires of Heaven as a a self-contained volume, like, really kicks off the start of whom I I think I'm going to refer to from now on as, like, Dark Rand. Right? So I did, and then I guess I ended that one with a with a question, but we pretty much answered it succinctly. And I just asked, "What do you guys think about where this book took him?" Yeah, I mean, I I agree with with everything you just said there. I, it's it is the beginning of Rand's insanity starting to not only be present internally but externally with him. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I mean, we see his foggy return to camp after the yeah. battle, for example. That if you had to pick one moment in the series where definitively something is going on with Rand, it's that moment. What do you mean something going on with Rand, though? Mentally. Like, uh, the combination of all of the pressure he's under, all of the darkness surrounding his life I would say in future, book nine, that's when it in has far matting, like, when he's... Oh, yeah, when he's locked away. Locked away, That yeah. might be one of the most profound moments of it, but this is certainly the first mm-hmm. of many to come. Yeah, 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 this is definitely uh, um, indicative of a kind huge of breaks down. Shift. Yeah. So I only have one more thing to say about Rand. Go for uh, it. And that is the the moment in Camelin when Robin kills Matt and Avienda and yes. Asmodian. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Not to sound like I'm um, excited about that. Sorry. Go ahead. Actually, this is this is a, a two part point as I think about it. One, the the quick one. That moment when Rand just screams, mm-hmm. Robin, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> they better knock that out of the park on the TV show. I cannot wait to see that. I can't. I'm so glad you just brought this up. This is in my in my list of miscellaneous reactions. I wanted to tell you guys this story um, about that exact line too. That delivery of that. There was a point uh, about two years ago. I was falling asleep and I was listening to a, to audiobooks. That's usually what I do when I'm falling asleep. You know, I was listening to The Fires of Heaven at this point. And a lot of the times, of course, I'll drift off and I'll wake up at like 2 in the morning and the audiobook is still playing. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. No, I'm, I'm, a few, I'm a few hours ahead. Sleep timers, dude. Michael Kramer's delivery of that line yes. <laughs> woke me up about. fucking terrified. <laughs> I, I was asleep in endless oceans of cotton candy not a care in the world and then out of my phone my phone came this noise this ravine and it woke me up and i shook and i was like what the hell was that and it i looked at my phone because i recognized the name ravi and i was like what the, what the hell was that it still gives me sweats That's thinking great. about how terrified i was when i woke up as uh, just yeah. so peacefully I, sleep. That's that's one of the standout moments of the whole series as far as audiobooks are concerned. Yeah. Oh, holy crap. We, uh, yeah, yeah I've, I've never heard it myself. Uh, it's I'll have to. You know what? For I you. should yeah. have it's written worth... down the exact timestamp because I don't think we would have had a problem just playing a one and a half second audio clip. No, yeah, we we would have been fine. I with should. That, but, yeah. Damn it. Oh well. But uh, but I will say though, like just reading it. The way it's written, like the all caps and and the extended, the number of A's yeah. that are there. Yeah, I have it written and, down here, A's for A's, copied exactly. Like, oh. And uh, every time I read that, I I get goosebumps because I see it and hear it so vividly in my head. Like this is one of the moments of 
most unbridled passion from Rand. Mm -hmm. Where, like, he... And this brings me to my second kind of aspect of this. He just saw one of his best friends in the world get killed. Yep. And he just saw the woman he just lost his virginity to get killed. Who's been at, like, attached to his hip for the last however many weeks, you know? And, uh, oh, well, what, like, three, four weeks? About a month? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds about yeah, right. Yeah, maybe a little but, bit, yeah. But, but, like, they've, they've had very intimate, uh, uh, circumstances. And, and I want to ask you guys, this anger that comes out of Rand... Who do you think he was more upset about being killed? Oh, Avienda. Oh, Avienda, without a doubt. That's just who I, Randolph see, I think is. So too. It's the way it's written. Yeah. You know, he he, it was, he lists the it characters was while in order he was of feeling importance. Avienda's yeah. cheek and how it was cooling already. Yeah. You know, he yep. he we, he saw Rand or he saw Rand. He saw Matt. You know, on the ground, splayed out. I think it was lightning that hit Matt and killed Matt. Yeah. He just kept running, but he well, saw the Avienda. Bolt killed all of them. What's that? The lightning bolt killed all of them. Yeah. He saw Avienda, and he stops, and he bends down, and he's kind of reverent, and then he feels her cheek, and, and, and senses that it's cooling, and then that noise comes out of him, you know, like... And I also love how it was that tingling. moment that, like, because uh, this ties into, like, the madness, Yes, and this is, like, madness in two senses, like, that the anger sense as well as the craziness sense, where that moment, seeing Avienda dead on the ground, is what pierces the veil so to speak and he remembers how to travel yeah because this is the first time rand makes a traveling gateway yes yeah my last quick little thing about rand is that i love him in this section of the books because when things like this happen to him now his reaction is not to be shocked or afraid or whatever like he would be before and it's not to mope around like he would later it's to go hard yeah. until everyone is dead because that's how Rand rolls. Yeah, we'll we'll revisit this at Dubai as well. So but it's a similar badass. Yeah, it's a similar reaction where where he's he's just like this insane thing has happened to me and my reaction is to lash out with violence. Yeah. And uh and and maybe that is another sign of the madness because Rand was always a gentle person before this. They talk about it a lot in in the two rivers. You know, Rand was always the very the gentle guy. But if you pushed him, <laughs> but if you pushed him, even the meekest yeah. and, dog and, will and, bite. And yeah, this is not now, this like, is not a push, it's a I mean, what what was the line? Like he opens the gateway and it's like like shooting lightning and fire through yeah yeah i think the line is lightning and fire preceded him yeah and i'm just like whoa (laughs) (laughs) can you imagine the look on robin's face robin's diaper was at that moment (laughs) he opens the the, he opens the portal directly into the fucking into the 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 palace into the throne room and he sees he sees Ah, robin go ah, oh ah, (laughs) oh my god robin the dragon throne I, I, Robin must have he needed cleaning after that I would imagine the rose lion. The, the, <laughs> the lion throne did I say the dragon it's throne the rose crown Whoops. and yeah. the lion throne yes yeah. uh, but I I, oh, I do want to say though like uh, as kind of a segue from character to character here I find it really interesting that well A all three of us agreed that Rand was angrier about Avienda than Matt oh yeah unquestionably but because uh, Matt's like one of Rand's best friends yeah mm-hmm. yeah and I, I think with Matt, part of that must come from how much Matt has tried to run away recently. Where Rand's been yeah. aware of this, you know? Yeah, Matt, but... Matt is constantly trying to escape this, like, the pattern. If it had been Perrin, do you think that your point would still stand, though? If he saw Perrin dead there? I think he still would have run past. Like, I don't know. I think it's just because well, well, and part Matt of that is a man. was that Matt was very clearly dead. Like Matt was literally blown out of his boots. Yeah, Matt's boots I, the, the were smoking there, boots, smoking I think is, on yeah. the cobblestones. Smoking boots. And Rand was like, "Maybe Avienda's still alive." You know. Hmm. So it was like in that moment, Rand was like, "Matt's dead." Avienda, <laughs> Avienda might still be alive. I, I love the thought that that's like, going through Rand's head. He's like, oh, "Matt's dead." Shit. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, because like in in this like adrenaline fueled yeah. shock, I know what you say. I just state, I love it. Yeah, you know, but uh, I don't know. I I just find it interesting, and and because I, I want to kind of transition into talking about Matt in this book, because once again, Matt is a lot in uh, Ranch Shadow. Yeah, in the Fires of Heaven, like he was in the Shadow Rising, <laughs> but. In this one, I think he starts to come out from the shadow a bit. Uh, I think Melindra is a big part of that. And I obviously the creation of the Band of the Red Hand at the end here is a huge deal for Matt. Yes. Uh, I didn't realize what I said was that funny, dude. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm just... I, I'm, I'm extrapolating that scene in my head, and I'm just thinking about <laughs> Rand seeing Matt dead on the ground. He just goes, Ah, sh- and he just keeps <laughs> he just keeps walking. The death of one of the Darn. main three, Tavir and the, the, the horn sounder. It's just I don't oh. know. It's something about the, the idiocy of that stupid scene that I keep playing over in my head. Sorry, go dude, go ahead. Yeah, uh, but but so with Matt, uh there there are the two big things that I, I just mentioned that I want to kind of dig into. One is Melindra and Matt's relationship with oh, her. Christ, yeah. And the other is the creation of the band of the red hand and Matt for the first time really uh embracing the use of these memories and like saying you know what like as much as i hate that this is like a part of me as much as i'm like thrown off by all this i am still that decent man at heart and even though i'm gonna put myself into personal danger i'm gonna go do this mm. yes. you know like because because this what is you mean? what are you talking about Matt Matt doesn't like that he has these memories in his head. Well, yeah, I, I mean, but... And so this is the first time he really embraces and uses the memories, especially in a selfless manner. You mean because he's in going the battle down. against the Shido? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's going down okay. to, to oh, save... Oh, I thought you meant... He's okay. Kyrian After and... Melindra's death, yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Um, oh, no, no, not with... Uh, I, 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 I thought, thought you were referring Melindra's to Melindra's a that. separate topic. We'll yeah, okay. get to that in, in a minute. I thought you were referring to the campaign against Andor, where he's... Clearly not embracing anything. He's clearly trying to get out and avoid oh, yeah. battle as I much as he can. I keep forgetting he did that. Finding him. Oh, that's in the and beginning. He, yeah, yeah. And he, he's like, well, I mean, he's obviously going to use what he knows yeah. to get himself out of trouble. No, but but specifically in the Battle of Kyrian, where where he's like, hey, you guys need to do this and that. See you later. And they're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, uh, no, he's totally in the zone, yeah, which is and, cool to see. And it's it's this unreliable narrator aspect with Matt, where this whole chapter is built up with him being like, how the hell do I get out of here? And it ends with him diving right into the thick of things yeah. to help other people. Mm. Right. So, against his better judgment, almost. Yeah, well, well, he would say it's against yeah. his better judgment. <laughs> because that's Matt. Yeah, he, uh, he, he likes that's to portray like himself as a oh, selfish God, he, person, so. but he is not selfish. He's yeah. a selfless man. Well, to an extent, he's selfish, but it's not nearly as much as he would have. He us is believe. selfish in petty things. Yeah, but in important things, in moral things, Matt is a very exactly. selfless person. Yeah, as as I think it was Swan that that uh, asked him later in the, the series. Burning you know, building. The burning building. The burning building. Exactly. No, that, what kind of man are you? Earth. Manned? My God, I can't speak today. But then that's again, how does that differ from any other right. podcast that we record? <laughs> yeah, in uh, Dragon Reborn. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, second match chapter, actually. The first match chapter is Awakening. The second is Oh, right, because Landfear's there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but I want to move on to talk about oh, Melindra. Oh, yeah, it was earlier. Bit. Yeah. Yeah, Melindra, okay, Yeah, the whole Melindra thing. The whole Melindra. So, Melindra is an interesting case with Matt, because because Matt is in Rand's shadow a lot in this book, we don't get tons of Matt points of view. Uh, and so we see a fair amount of his relationship with Melindra sort of from a remove. We we see them interact from Rand's perspective, yes. or from Egwene's perspective. When the Dark Hounds attack, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but we still do get some scenes from Matt's point of view and the really the uh profound one is of course at the end here or near the end where Melindra tries to kill him and you know she's got the uh the Ilian bees on the knife uh you know another sign that like Samael is involved and in trying to like manipulate Rand and um, I, for the first time, 
took a step back after reading that this time and thought about what what it would feel like to a guy, to a 19-year-old guy. This is the woman you presumably lost your virginity to, because that's the theme in this book. Uh, <laughs> um, suddenly, you find out she is not only trying to kill you, like full-on kill you, but she is a dark friend. Like, what, yeah. what would that do to you? As, like, like your, your trust in relationships going forward? Like, you're... Like, this is... Melindra is somebody that Matt opened up to in a lot of ways. And... And he's been living with her, you know, for this whole, like, campaign. They've been sharing a tent. Whenever they, like, post up in a town, they're sharing a room. All this stuff. Oh, I don't he's know. He's been in intimate circumstances with her, and... And yeah, he hasn't known her that long, but he's shared a lot of things with her. I I would argue that he hasn't, though. I mean, think about how he was trying to leave uh, the, the before you know the battle even happened, and how he's trying to hide it from Melindra. And he's the last thing that he wants is for Melindra to find out that he's leaving. You know, that just like that doesn't strike me as somebody who really cares too much about. Uh, I I think that says the opposite. This person. I think if is he it... didn't care about her, he wouldn't give a shit what she thought. And he no, wouldn't so bother trying to hide him. Your from. your angle is that if she knew he was leaving, she'd be ashamed of him, and he doesn't want that. No, no, no. It's just he's no, no. To Drew, I was saying no. to Drew because no, I I think I that was that Matt trying to convince himself because he knew that if she found out and she like tried to stop him, he wouldn't be able to say no because he's grown that close to her. This is him trying to jump through hoops. I think this is him avoiding responsibility because he's going to have to look her in the eyes and, and hear it, like and hear difficult questions that he doesn't want to yeah. have to answer. But it doesn't strike me as somebody who cares mm. too much about her. I never, yeah, I, I, th I think Matt and Melindra's relationship always came across as more shallow to me. Well, and so this was where I, I was going to like ask a question next, and and that gives okay. me an answer. Uh, in in the grand scheme of relationships in the wheel of time mm -hmm. um up until this point i never really considered like melindra as like any sort of a possibility for a long-term relationship for matt uh the first time you read the fires of heaven did you see the beginning of their relationship and think like oh this is going to be Matt's no not at love all interest because yeah, he no. keeps asking her about do, are you sure the daughter of the nine moons doesn't ring any bell and she's like no i have no yeah, idea we, what you're talking about yeah, we have that. I had that yeah, point. Well, I was like, I okay, mean, that, so but that's not necessarily this, a. This yeah, has a not necessarily time limit. Um, on it. It, okay, I, I I was just curious about that, but but I I do want to say like even even if you see that relationship as like a shallow thing, this is still an intimate act that Matt is sharing. Of, of course, with her, yeah. And and suddenly she's turning around and trying to kill him. Like yeah, it's not like they dislike each other or anything like that. I think Melindra likes matt on a certain level i mean mm -hmm. like like she's saying as she's dying you know i always liked your pretty eyes that indicates to us that she's not just getting close to matt on dark friend business no yeah that there's something yeah. there's something more than that going on but not quite i don't know a legitimate she was already she was already dealt romance she was already dealt a mortal time. blow and she decided to still once again try and kill him with a dagger as it hits because the she's, she's a dark friend and an Aiel. Yeah, yeah I know, dark, but it's the Aiel. I think at that she, point she could have just like, okay, you know, I failed. You know, I don't think the like, I don't know. Well, that's not the Aiel way. Uh, I suppose. But, but that's why I'm saying on this read through, I I I think I saw. Had she not been a dark friend, had she just been a maiden of the spear? Oh yeah. Melindra could have been a great match for that. Oh, I, I, hey, I totally agree with that part. I absolutely agree. I, I did love the chemistry between those two and the way they kind of teased each other back and forth. They did mm -hmm. have a great chemistry, and I could have seen that definitely turning into a long-time relationship for Matt. I could have seen Matt, that if she wasn't a dark friend. Matt would have grown to resent her constantly pushing him to towards sure, glory. Sure, sure. Eventually. Do you think that was uh, an inherent Melindra trait, or was that her being a dark friend, though? Because I, I that's a theme with dark friends. In well, this Savannah is the one is the parallel who comes to mind for me, and that makes it an ideal. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, that's fair. See, I was thinking about how Lanfear 
constantly pushes yeah. Matt and Perrin. What, what is it with all the evil women in this series <laughs> trying to push men into doing things? But, yeah. but okay, the, the, I, I think that was good. I, I got some answers and kind of put my mind to rest about Melindra. Cool. Um, but I, I just appreciated her more in this book than I did uh, uh, in this read uh, than I did in the past. Hmm. That's totally okay. fair. A fair. I, I agree. I, I can see. So so let's move on to Perrin. <laughs> or the lack thereof. <laughs> and now that we finish with Perrin. And now that we finish with Perrin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. He's still he's still busy. <clears throat> on, his, on his honeymoon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> About five different I, foul I, things to say, jostled there to, were, to try to get out of my mouth. I still want to talk. None of them came out. I still want to talk about both Nynaeve and Warren. Who should we? Who should we begin with? Who do you think? I want to. I want to talk about Elena and Nynaeve oh, first. Oh, okay, Elena and Nynaeve. Yeah. Uh, because I, I also want to talk about Galad. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is this is the section of the book that really like I loved the, the traveling circus stuff. Okay. When they're like fully ingrained and they're like part of the show, you know? Yeah. And they arrive at Samara and then we get this stuff with Masima and the Shianarans and then Galad shows back up and and they're like, Alright, we gotta get out, you know, and all this stuff and, and the riots. And I think this is um another spot in the series where oh, how do I put it? Like Elaine annoys people, right? Sure. Annoys yes. readers. Sure. Yes. But I think in this section, she is. She's really genuine. Like, she comes across as a yeah. very realistic person. Agreed. And in and while her interactions with people can be frustrating sometimes, I can empathize with how she acts mm -hmm. especially with Galad like even though I like Galad I think he's a great character I can understand how somebody who grew up with him would be so just like adamantly cheers yeah. hell yes yeah. I agree like when reading this from our perspective as readers like, yeah, it's easy to be like, oh, Elaine, you're being so stupid. Oh, you're being so obnoxious or stubborn or whatever. But if you then considered, like, what would it be like growing up, living for 16, 17 years with this guy? Yeah, I it would, it would so frustrate much. the piss out of me. It would. Like righteousness? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, annoyance. Because Galad and Elaine are annoying and Gawain. And if I had to well, live yeah. for 16 well. years with all three of those people... Suicide would be a happy alternative. I mean, Galad is un unrelentingly <laughs> righteous. That's that's his thing. And yes. As a teenager, like, look, everybody's going to be breaking some rules during their teenage years. Amen. Yeah. Heck yeah. Like, what, what would it be like if every time you wanted to go do something fun, your brother was right there being like, yeah, I'm going to go tell on you. And he has resources. Lots of yeah. resources. And not only that, your older brother. <laughs> yeah. Like, like of course that would drive. I can see nuts. why she would my, form a much closer my relationship. My helped get me into trouble, Gowan. not kept me out. Oh, I'm well aware. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I can see why she would form a much closer relationship with Gawain, not counting the fact that she is way, you know, much closer yes. related yeah. to him in terms of blood relation. But just mm -hmm. based on yeah, personality I, alone, I can also see why yeah. she would gravitate towards Gawain as a as a sibling. Yeah. And Galad becoming a white cloak. It's kind of like it the makes logical... so much sense. It's, it's what... See, Galad conclusion. becoming a white cloak is one of these things that I... For some... I, I It makes so much sense, and I don't know why I didn't see it coming, despite the yeah. fact that I was only a oh, teenager yeah. and I was still inexperienced, for the most part, reading these books as a reader. I don't know why I still... Even that version of me still didn't see this coming. It's so obvious. Yeah, like, Galad is the ideal white cloak. And I have a good like, point about Galad later. The, the one... The one who isn't blinded by irrational hatreds, but is truly working to uphold all these good values and fight for the light. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he, he is a child of the light. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and on top of that, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, like, Galad is such a boss during that Samara riot. Or, like, the she and Arns, it's described as, like, the wave of rioters is, is, um... 
like washing up against the line of Shi'anarins, but it breaks on Galad. Yeah. Where, where like people are charging him, screaming, and then after he kills like eight yes. or nine of them, they're all like, "Oh, nope, we're out." Like, yeah, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Don't yeah. want any of that. So, so. Uh, naive. Yeah. What do you got to say about naive? Oh, um, I well, I mean, I've got a lot. A lot to say about Nynaeve. Um, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna stop here and acknowledge that if I remember correctly, I had a lot of positive things to say about Nynaeve in our last episode, uh, Fires of Heaven Part Two. But in light of that, I'm now going to say, hang on to your asses, everybody, because reading Nynaeve gave me an absolute plethora of items to add to my list of why Nynaeve pisses me off. <laughs> And I, I, I'm not shitting when I say I'm not shitting you when I say this. I have a list to get through. So we're gonna fight about this. <laughs> buckle up, everybody. This is All gonna right. this is gonna take a few minutes, guys. I'm not kidding. So the well, main reason. Sorry, go ahead. Were you gonna say no, something? No, 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 no. Okay. The main yeah. reason that Nynaeve pisses me off so much in this section of the book, <laughs> if I really had to introspectively observe, would be that it's just that she's so irrational. And I do understand that part of being human means being irrational at times about something or other. I get that. Plenty of other characters in this series have certain neurotic tendencies that give them that gesture of humanity, that lend them that that bit of, you know, uh, sympathy. Nynaeve, though. Can I ask a quick question? Go for it. Can I ask a quick question? Is the reason you're so fixated on irrationality right now, uh, might that be... um, uh, side effect of having read some Mbot recently? No, not a, <laughs> an, what Mbot like Skyward Mbot? Yeah. Okay. What the? Just f- curious. I, I, I'm really, this whole I'm thing really is about like irrational, like irrational humans and like. Oh. And how? Okay. Oh, sorry. No, I was what, what that was still a, that was still a primer for me saying I get that people can be irrational, but I'm still going to just lay into and savage naive for the next few minutes. No, okay. I I'm, I was just curious like if if this a theme of okay. irrationality left out at you because of gotcha. a similar or related subject matter that you've been reading recently. This is kind of the, I I guess I'm saying that the list I'm about to give that was what I was looking for. Were certain moments, specific moments of human irrationality that was just mm-hmm. beyond kind of believability for that character. Hmm. Okay. So, so this, so like I said, this following list, this is taken almost entirely out of the sequence of that of Nynaeve that we got from chapters forty-seven through forty-nine. Okay. Um, so first off, number one, there's a moment earlier in the earlier in the, this sequence. I'm not sure if it was in this sequence or before that, but Uno, she meets Uno, and he drags mm-hmm. her off by the elbow, and the men being Tom and Juilin, notice, and, they, and they, they, they go to intervene, but she gestures them back, and she thinks indignantly about how foolish they are for not thinking she can protect herself. But then, later, as they are leaving Val and Luca's menagerie, Luca himself does that same thing. He grabs her, and he tows her off for a private chat. And she's offended that these men would just watch that and not intercede, of course. <laughs> Number well, that's a totally different circumstance. How? She's being... Because they know Val and Luca, and and they didn't know Uno. But they also know Luca's intentions. They also know that he's taken an unnatural interest in Nynaeve. Oh, Luca wasn't going to try to rape her. No, like, but well, Nynaeve so, also knows that about... I guess, okay, I guess you're right. They no, do have so, some familiarity previously with Luca. Because okay, looking I would, at, I would looking grant at you that. Uno, like, he's a, he's a terrifying he's looking, a dare- like, clearly <laughs> battle-scarred veteran. He is. Like, like ruffian, you know, and and to them, okay. they're like, oh, you know, and so from Nynaeve's perspective, I can understand how she'd be indignant that like in this circumstance, it looks like I'm getting attacked, and they don't trust me to defend myself. Whereas in the Val Luca circumstance, it doesn't look like I'm getting attacked, but I'm really annoyed about this. So why don't they help? Me? Okay, I I might be willing <laughs> to concede a bit the fact that they that that Tom and Julian actually have some sort of previous experience with Val and Luca. Okay, you know what? I'll, I'll, yeah, I will see that point. Um, but I have a few more <laughs> now. Okay. So, number two. There's a moment in chapter 47 where she, Nynaeve, is throwing insults back and forth with Elaine. And it's quite even on both sides. Insult, 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 insult. Insult, right. and then again, another insult. But then Nynaeve thinks, why could the woman not say anything without a barb? 
As if Nynaeve herself hasn't been doing that exact same thing on every opportunity she gets. And not just in this sequence for the entire book. Oh, yeah. Yep. Now. No, this, this is a common thing. Okay, number three. <laughs> there's a moment when, when Dreelin Sandar, he slips up and he speaks the name Mulgedian. He says it out loud. After which Nynaeve thinks about how frustrated she is with Elaine for letting the men know too much. Um, and I, I, I stopped and wrote down, you mean the f- about the fact that they're potentially interfering with the Black Aja and one of the Forsaken personally? Imagine right. that! You know? Yeah, no, that's one of the rare instances where I side with Elaine over Nynaeve. Yeah, yeah. And just so um, we're... Because, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it, uh, for all that Nynaeve dislikes Aes Sedai, she certainly embraced the sort of Aes Sedai mystique and mystery thing really quickly. Yeah. Um, not telling business or anything like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and so it is frustrating to see Nynaeve like this. And this is, I, I think, kind of one of the early instances of Elaine's radius of suck <laughs> happening. Yeah. Where, like, while yeah. Elaine isn't necessarily awful, she sort of brings out the worst in the people around her. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. Except well, um, Tom is immune. Yeah. In, in that, in, in that <laughs> moment when, when Julian sure Tom's... <laughs> slips up and he says Mulgedian, he was actually making a pretty good point. And Nynaeve actually acknowledges that, of course, internally. But then she mm-hmm. has to add, and, and just so we're clear, the, act, the we're, we're clear, the actual quote is, letting men know too much was always a mistake. The trouble was, he was right. But letting a man know that too quickly was a mistake, too. And I just read that and rolled my eyes. I'm like, yeah, it's typical Nynaeve. Yeah, we'll blame that on women's circle culture. Yeah, of, of course. Yeah. yeah, I don't think Nynaeve is the only female in the fiction. No, universe, no, but Nynaeve is a stellar universe. example. <laughs> um, I, I, there are so that's, plenty of women out there who want all men to be members of the Mushroom Club. That's three out of my shit. nine oh, items. Oh, good black company reference. Thank you. Very nice. Oh, I, I will definitely be able to appreciate that listening to this later than after I've covered black company. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so those are, that's three out of my nine examples here. I still have a few more to get through, ladies and gentlemen. Um, number four. Nynaeve takes it upon herself to A, tell Galad that they're in desperate need of a ship, and B, on the spur of a moment... Th- uh, she decides to meet privately with Bloody Masima and tell him the same thing, that they're desperately yeah. in need of a ship. And yet, when the ship arrives and pandemonium breaks out, she's not only surprised that her actions caused this, but she also decides to blame Galad. Because, you know, he was supposed to watch the Prophet's men take over that ship that Nynaeve tells her she desperately needs and think, yeah. you know what, I'm just going to go let her know the ship is here. Of course he decided yeah. to fight for it! He wasn't aware that you asked the prophet for the same thing. So whose fault is it? Oh, it must be Gulad's fault. Bec- like, Yeah. That, no, that's that's a very fair point, and, and yeah. I agree. That's like... Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. number five. At one point, the men in the party are starting to bicker. Tom and Dreelin, they can bicker a little bit. And Elaine tries to intercede. I think maybe they're bickering. There's some stuff happening with Uno as well, or Gulad. Elaine tries to intercede with soft reason. And Nynaeve cuts her off and just spits venom at everyone. And her thought process, by the way, during this moment was, Elaine would have used honeyed words again, and they might have worked. But she wanted to lash out at something. That's just so indicative of everything Nynaeve so far, uh, just yeah. in this part of the book. <laughs> Number six, they're picking up, the, the, you know, to leave the menagerie, and Nynaeve sees Elaine packing without the spangled coats and britches that she's been making fun of Elaine for, and she almost adds that Elaine was forgetting them, but decided, out of the benevolence of Her Majesty Nynaeve the Flawless, that she would not, because, and I quote, she knew how to promote harmony. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Seven. Nynaeve's oh. weakest point Sorry, is ahead. her own opinion of her conflict resolution skills. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when the Shan Chen woman Sarandon is the only one who doesn't show up for goodbyes, Nynaeve mentally references the events wherein Sarandon supposedly assaulted Nynaeve. <laughs> yep. Number eight. Hey, remember that moment when Nynaeve out of nowhere decided to take it upon herself to meet with Masima? And tell him she was in desperate need of a ship. She doesn't seem to recall this later when Elaine decides, you know what, I'm going to weave some wind on the River Serpent for a faster voyage. And then Nynaeve scolds Elaine for always doing things without thinking. Now, to be fair, Nynaeve was correct about Elaine. Elaine does that all the time. She's just being hypocritical. That's my problem with Nynaeve in in that moment. And last but not least... Number nine, after meeting with Egwene and the Wise Ones, Nynaeve reminds Elaine that she doesn't own Rand. 
But then Elaine fires back about Lan being surrounded by Kyrian and Noblewoman. After which, Nynaeve thinks to herself, and she grumpily goes off to sleep thinking, Lan better not forget to whom he belongs. <sighs> so, I'm done. Yeah. And I'm open for responses now. You guys, okay. fire back. So, I've got, so... two, I've got two things. Okay, okay. Go Well, it's, it's sort of one thing, but in two parts. Like, a, you said, you know, the, the hypocrisy, right? Yeah. Just because you're a hypocrite does not mean you're wrong. No, it's It just means true. you're a hypocrite. Yes. And Nynaeve is often a hypocrite. Sometimes she's right, but other times she's wrong. Yeah. I'll admit that. Yeah. But it is important to note that it is, it's a relatively even split. Mm-hmm. Second, this is, this book and the one before it are pivotal in Nynaeve becoming the awesome character that we get to enjoy later on. Sure. It's Agreed. sort of like, this is her getting the worst out of the way. And as she's learning. She's having learning experiences. The one thing you can say for her is that she's very eager to learn. And she does. Like, she might not admit yeah. it to herself, but... Oh, of course. She has a lot to learn from these experiences. Yeah. And she does, which is the good part. Yeah, the yeah. moment that, that comes to mind is when she's considering you know, staying in Salidar. This is a build-up of things that culminates in um, A Crown of Swords. At right. the moment where Nynaeve stops, like, because she's on the one side of, like, being a bad character, but then she becomes a good character. Yeah. Like, the balance tilts. Well, well I wouldn't say she's a bad character. Yeah, excuse uh, me. She, uh, she's she... a frustrating character. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, in the way that, like, Egwene, not... for instance, isn't a yeah. bad character, but she's a frustrating character. I didn't mean to imply or, that she was poorly or written at, or something at early like points, that. like our, our infamous asshole episode for <laughs> Rand. Rand wasn't a bad character. He was a frustrating character. Yeah, right. I agree um, with that. But, but yeah, I, I, I have kind of one point just like uh, for your last, I think it was the ninth item on your list, <laughs> about her, her mentality of like men belonging to women. Yeah there right where she's like i hope land doesn't yeah i think that is less indicative of nynaeve's personality and more so about the uh Aes Sedai culture that oh, okay. surrounds warders oh because, I, interesting i hadn't looked at it from because that angle it's set up so much that the Aes Sedai are the ones in control that essentially warders do belong to their Aes Sedai and Lan is a warder. And Warren is such a powerfully charismatic person. You know, like in, in her own way. She's a domineering personality. Oh, yeah. And so it's easy for Nynaeve in a circumstance like this to see Lan as being treated like property by Moiraine and not being free to pursue what otherwise he may you know want to with Nynaeve and she's buying in here and this is a flaw because I think it's an inherent flaw in Aes Sedai culture period but the fact that Nynaeve is buying into this mentality of warders belonging to people right yeah so she's she's treating Lan simultaneously as a love interest and as a pawn in a power struggle between herself and Warren, which you know that that power struggle has been going on since they met yeah. at the beginning of Idol. No, that, that's a really good point to bring up because, like, in context of the reason I was bitching about that last exact point, when you think she was arguing with Elaine in that moment, and uh, Elaine is it was talking about owning Rand, and that's what kind of set Nynaeve off for this, you know, hypocrisy that I called it. But at the same time, you think, what is Rand to Elaine? Yes, yeah, she loves him, but she's also she considering him for a warder. So that does yep. make sense, actually. I, I'm uh, I'm willing to say that I didn't consider it that way. Yeah. So, so like, I'm not going to try to absolve Nynaeve sure. of that mentality uh, because I think it is a deeply problematic mentality. Yeah. Any, any time that you're treating another human being as property, uh, we got some issues. Yeah. But... <laughs> Uh, regardless <laughs> of whether Chan. the warders volunteer <laughs> for it or not. Uh, yeah, right. Um, right. But, but I think playing off of what Pat said, it, it, this ties to all the characters in this book and in The Shadow Rising, where, yes, a good character arc is going to feature growth. It, it has to, if it's going to be satisfying. I think, especially in these two books, 
we are seeing these characters really grow. We're seeing them mature rather than just learning new things the way they were in the first few books where they're they're experiencing the wider world, gaining new information and having that information you know, like alter them. Now they're actually maturing as adults. And the, this is sort of a foundational period for Nynaeve specifically. As Pat said, that's going to culminate in things that happen in... Um, a Crown of Swords, yeah. A Crown of Swords and Winter's Heart and Knife of Dreams. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's like growing pains is how I would yeah. describe it. And, and to wrap up Nynaeve, I just want to reiterate again that this is the point at which I am most frustrated with Nynaeve. And yeah. like Fayil oh, in my episode sure. bitching about Fayil, I want to say it was in part two, maybe part one of The Shadow Rising. You know, my my opinion of Nynaeve only improves from this point forward. Yes. Mm-hmm. The biggest mm-hmm. contrast between her and Elaine. Yeah, I mean, she still that... does some, like, bullheaded <laughs> things. Yes. But, uh, but Nynaeve yeah. gets better, and Elaine doesn't. Elaine gets worse. <laughs> yeah, that's accurate. But, yeah, Elaine uh, doesn't quite get to the level of, of Nynaeve dreams. in this book, though, in terms of frustrating to read, at least for me. Knife of Dreams makes me want to take the Knife of Dreams and stare <laughs> at it over and over again. Well, that's <laughs> something we'll address just... in a couple of months here. <laughs> but, yeah. Um... But are there any other months, characters like that six. you guys want to discuss um, before we go into a few like lower points? Moraine. Let's talk about Moraine. All right. Yeah, yeah. And well, I, I, I didn't write down a whole lot to talk about awesome Moraine. Character. Awesome. So awesome. The letter, the letter that she writes has all of the great points of her character just encapsulated in this one little document, yeah. Yeah. coupled with her actions yeah. that day. There like, are. This so... is what I'm about. Yeah. This is how I roll. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's so many hints in this book about what's to come for Moiraine throughout the like just just seeded throughout the entire thing. I'm almost tempted to say that Jordan was approaching the the area of heavy handed with this, as like she's acting very differently during her last days or weeks with Rand. <clears throat> but you know, looking back and, and looking about you know how how her supposed her her final scene here with Lanfear and her confrontation with Lanfear and and her death I use with air quotes. Uh, it took me by surprise when I was a teenager. It still did. I mean, it ripped my heart out. I do remember that day, too. I remember where I was. I remember what time it was. I remembered exactly what I was doing and how I just kind of walked around in a catatonic state afterward. Um, the only book I've, I've that's even approached me, that's leaving me with that kind of walking around in a daze, has been Words of Radiance. Um, but hmm. specifically with Moiraine, you know, I didn't see it as a teenager. I didn't see it coming, so it hit me so hard. And I, I love these these little moments that Jordan has seeded throughout this narrative. When when she tells Rand, it, she it's take chapter fifty one for example. She tells him not once, but twice. She says to him, "You will do well." And the yeah. latter is mm-hmm. like the second time is said, <clears throat> pardon, with a with a fondness in her voice, like just hours before her confrontation with Lanfear. Um, and I just I just want to to cement this fact and make it and, and, and make sure that I say this here and now. I love Moiraine. She Moiraine is my waifu. <laughs> I'll agree that this is her peak, although if we're talking about which of the Wheel of Time women <laughs> I would most like to spend the rest of my life with, Moiraine is not yeah. no? at the top of the list. Right. Besides, mm. she's not into younger men, apparently. Mm. No. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> well, how old is let? Okay, Warren's at what? 40, 42 in this. She's in her fifties, I think. No, she is in her. She's 60s? like forty-two. Yeah, right. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I have to double check. She's she's somewhere between forty and forty-two. I think we, we we could infer that because Swan thinks about how old she is or how much younger she looks than what she really is, and we know that Swan and Warren are so similar in age. Take the level of a young accepted. And then add Rand's age to that. <laughs> yeah, Moiraine is uh, at the beginning of the series. She is forty-two. So okay. at this oh. point, she's forty-three. Okay. Okay. But she yeah. she was born in nine fifty-six. Doesn't look like it though. And the series starts <laughs> uh, nine ninety-eight. But none of them do, do they? Yeah. Well, some of them do. They do have gray hair. But you're right. I see. I, I see the point that you make though. The agelessness. But so yeah. That's, that's pretty much it with me for any of my character points. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I'd like to... Yeah, I can leave it there. And leave it happy. there? Okay. 
So, I don't have a ton of, like, lore things to talk about uh, in this stretch of uh, the book. Um, I, I do... The main one, though, is just to, like, reinforce this. Matt's link to the horn was broken when Robin killed him. Yes! This is something I wanted to talk about in the Shadow Rising, but I couldn't because Peter was there. Love you, Peter. Not complaining. <laughs> but yeah, th- th- this is this was the moment where Matt's link with the horn was broken. This was the moment that later in the series, one of the wise ones referenced. I can't remember who it was, but they told Matt, you know, that that happened at an earlier time. Okay, uh, like no, it was Arthur Hawkwing. Was it talks to Matt at the end of a Memory of Light? And and he's like Matt's like whoa like what what happened here with the I horn? thought it was and he's oh. like and Matt's like oh it was when I sang and Arthur Hawkwin says it wasn't the tree it was another time one you do not remember I thought he was being scolded and saying you live uh, by the dragon's sufferance like twice over like that he has saved you twice and I thought it was during that moment but I oh know he was oh being that, scolded by I mean, woman that, that might point. have been but that's that's more nebulous that's like sure, Rand sure. saved your life yeah. No, oh, Arthur you're right. Hawkwing you're right. Arthur Hawkwing said no. Another moment tells Matt in a memory of light. That's right. He did not die on the tree. He died another, another moment. That he one that he remember, doesn't remember. He can't remember it because yeah. of the balefire. Got you. Okay, cool. Any uh, other lore points? Um, no, not really. Okay. Uh, more of like a. Well, maybe this counts as lore. Um, so we're gonna delve a little bit into the beginning of Lord of Chaos on this. Okay. Um, with Mogedian. Because there's a lot of confusion about how she gets captured mm, by Nynaeve. I'm so in the dream, right, Nynaeve collars her. <laughs> and then she gives her fork root. Mm. But then it's like, well, obviously you don't stay collared in the... Like, you don't just become collared in the real world. Right. But the fork root affected her. Yeah, it was... And a... so they basically searched through Saladar to find the woman who was like drugged out of her mind yeah. asleep couldn't be woken and kept her sedated until Elaine could craft yeah. the Adam yeah uh, because because there there's a lot of confusion that I see in the forums about that where they're like well yeah Nynaeve did that but that was in the world of dreams how did it like carry over yeah. to the real world and it's it's the fork route that carried over and just like a lot of yeah I see. I, I was definitely confused by that as a teenager when I read this for the first time, second time, third time, tenth time. I was still a little confused by that. <laughs> but what what really made it make sense to me was when I uh, when I realized that uh, Nynaeve, what like the reason Mogedian was so afraid was because Nynaeve couldn't leave her in the world of dreams like that because she would have escaped. The reason right. Mogedian was so scared for her life in that moment was because well, Nynaeve might have to cut her throat. Or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then it was yeah. the fork root that gave her the excuse. Okay, I don't have to kill you. But, and I love Nynaeve's little moment of viciousness there when she tells her, Hey, so yeah. uh, we're on to you, by the way. You know you know Swan's name. You know Faye Lane's name. So um, we'll see you when you wake up. Yeah. I did like yeah. that. It was cool. Sleep tight, bitch. <laughs> Sleep tight, bitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a so there's another lore thing actually I just remembered and, Ooh. and uh, I don't know if this was ever actually addressed, um, but it brings up a, a theory possibility. So Rand Balefire's Robin. Right? Yes. Balefire's the shit out of Robin. Yes. Afterward, Rand still had the bites and things from the fish. Oh, could that yes. be Teleron Riot? I didn't consider that. Oh. Literally, he was and, in Teleron Riot in the flesh though. Yeah. And he, his guard doesn't uh, disappear, right? That also happened in Teleron Riyadh, in the flesh. Didn't it? Mm, we, uh, I don't know what... Well, no, like, wounds in Teleron Riyadh, whether you're in the flesh or not, are, like, they're real. Yeah, but they're in varying degrees of what severity, I'm, depending on how much in the dream What I'm talking you are. about is that the fact that he bale-fired Robin... Yeah. And yet the wounds from the fish didn't go away. Because, yeah, because he was in Teleron Riyadh as strong as one can be in the flesh. That's why it affected him so severely, I would think, against the... No, 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 you're missing the point. You're missing the sorry, point. Sorry, sorry. Okay, point go is, ahead. Ravin ostensibly created the fish. Yes. In Teleron Riyadh to attack Maybe. Rand. Yes, and, and then, Rand's... So if Rand had bale fired Ravin as he did, then those fish never should have been made and those wounds should have gone away. Yes, Maybe I get that. Maybe it was another Forsaken. 
Yeah, so so it doesn't matter whether Rand's in the flesh in Teleronrad or not. But that's, as Pat said, this is my theory on this, is that those were created by probably Grandal. That there were oh. other Forsaken uh, because Mogedian was there. like the, mm. And we already knew that Grandal and Lanfear and uh, Samael and Robin were in cahoots and tri- planning a trap for Rand in Camelon. And so, if it was anybody, it's likely Grandal. Yeah, if it was, it was anybody, Grandal, Grandal would she, absolutely be the number one candidate for sure. Because she's present in Camelot she's in present in Camelot. We see, uh, <laughs> yeah, as we yeah. as we know, she's present in Camelot at the end of this book. Um, but I I, I don't know yeah. if I can accept that because she would have felt the one power from Nynaeve and felt the one power from Mogedian. You know, like I I I think the fact that like I I get what you're saying. The fact that Rand Bale fired the sh out of Ravine to the point where Nynaeve and, and Matt were miraculously alive Avienda afterwards. And, and Matt, yeah. Sorry, Nynaeve, did I say? Whoops. Avienda and Matt were, were miraculously alive. But I just... I I don't know. The, I, if those fish were made by Robin... I get it. I get it. If they were Robin, Just they, like the lightnings that were made away. by Robin also never never struck Avienda. Yeah. In, but that was done in the waking world. That wasn't done in Teleronriad. I think the fact that it was done in Teleronriad, in the flesh, kind of um, buffs it against the unraveling of the pattern, perhaps. I don't know. That's just that's my theory. I'm not saying that's what I like. That's certain in any way. That's that, that would be my my theory in response. Because <laughs> I don't know if I can accept that the the likelihood that Grandal would have just been unnoticeable in any other form in Teleron Riyadh during that climactic moment with Ravine. I think it, it would have been made somewhat more obvious somewhere in the text. Oh, and then again, you could argue that that was her killing of Asmodian. Well, well, so mm. I will say this to that, though, and this is what makes it, like, like it would be a retcon, essentially. Okay. Because when Robert Jordan wrote this book, Grandal did not kill Asmodia. Oh. Did he know who did, though? Yes. Or was he still planning? Okay. Demandred did. Demandred was Tyene when he first wrote these books. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Because I know that was one of the, the most popular that? fan theories. I read, know. I remember discussing that endlessly no, before no, okay, the, the okay. last so, three books. I didn't so, think that was actually a retcon, though. Holy shit. I, this is, okay, I'm just learning so this. When he wrote Fires of Heaven, when he wrote Lord <clears> of Chaos, <throat> Tyene was Demandred. Oh, that makes so much Robert sense Jordan now. Robert changed his mind. Oh my and god, this, okay. This came out, I don't know how you missed this, dude. This came out of Jordan Con like three years ago during the Robert Jordan's Notes panels where Therese full on revealed in Robert Jordan's Notes, written right there, Demandred killed Asmodian. How Demandred the f- was Taim. Did I not hear this? This is three years ago? Yeah, it was a, it was a long time ago. Oh, it's not that long ago in my terms of the real time experience. I have no excuse for not knowing this. How the f did I miss that? I, I don't know. Okay, but, sorry. But yeah, yeah, so okay. at this point in the book... Touche. But that said... Um, so, that said, it could have originally been Demandred was there in the World of Dreams when all this was going down. And this was uh, uh, something Demandred did Damn. with the fish, trying Could to mess with Rand. imagine if Demandred and Ravenon fought back to back? They would have fucked him up. Even Randall Yeah, but, but Demandred wasn't part of that little group, so he wasn't in on the trap. Mm. Yeah, I would just love to. I would love to the. <clears throat> sorry, my throat's fucked up. The idea of that being actually ha- like real, and then uh, Ravine like trying to fight for his life against Randall Thor, and suddenly there's this water, and these fish start attacking the Dragon Reborn. He's like, "What the fuck is this guy doing to himself? Does he not know?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Teleron Riyadh. Mm-hmm. Huh, interesting. So, so this is like a conundrum, and as far as I know, there isn't a, a solid uh, canon answer or even like a quote from team jordan on it or anything uh but but it is a question though. yeah it has been brought up uh several times cool. over the years in, in you know on dragon mountain theory land and the facebook forums cool. and stuff like that so right but on. i think that's the end of my my lore set good i have there. two questions for you then that okay. i that i decided to write down and ask you on this final episode of the fires of heaven number one the ivory carving for land fear to pick up i assume uh, Moiraine saw that in one of her visions of the future from Roydion. Yes. And mm-hmm. what? But I, my my question is, what was the purpose? Was that like to just like assuage Landfear and and make her like complacent and unwary of sudden physical attack as she's so filled with the one power? Um, I think there were several points there. Uh, one, it made Landfear substantially stronger than Rand on a raw strength scale. Right. So yeah. that of course Rand you want couldn't that to overcome her. Oh. Oh yeah. Uh. And 
and for two, it allows Moiraine access to it later down the line. Oh, it does, doesn't it? That's right. I totally forgot about that. Cool. Okay. I, I accept that answer. Um, number two, what the hell really happened with that red stone, do- uh, red stone, red stone doorway? Like, why did it just up and decide to melt itself through the wagon and, and seal this so, portal that had stood for literally millennia? It's, um, we get a little bit of like a hint of this being possible in the Shadow Rising when Rand, Moiraine, and Matt are all in it. Yeah, I and was thinking the about this. The portal is becoming unstable, essentially. I couldn't come up with where, an answer. And, and so when there's that much of the one power in use going through it, it basically made it so unstable it melted. But Rand was using the one power, and oh, of course he was just doing the sword, though he wasn't like exerting yeah, he, himself. He was he was using very little of it. Yeah, you're right. He was using and, very little. And of this is Lanfear, full on, full strength Lanfear with a near Saangreal but, level. Then again, these these portals were open during the Age of Legends, weren't they? A lot of people were as strong as Lanfear during the Age of Legends. No, and, they weren't. Uh, okay, no. Lanfear is literally no. As you're strong right. No, as you're right. Get. I I totally I totally <laughs> take that last one back. What the hell was I thinking saying that? No, Lanfear was one of the strongest channelers of the women to ever walk the planet, right? Yes. Yeah, no, okay, right. no, I take that back. Yeah, the, the, it but is impossible. I just, I, I find it hard to believe that Lanfear. nobody in the, in the Age of Legends even, like, could, like, drew enough of the power any time going through that to actually, you know... So, so, but that's my point, is, like, this is way more, like, somebody would have had to be crazy powerful by themselves and be using a Sa'angreal in order to destabilize it and have another fairly powerful channeler also involved. Oh, I don't even think Moiraine Lanfear... registers on compared to Lanfear plus that Angreal. I don't even think Moiraine even registers on that kind of no, side. But she might have wielding. been just enough to tip it over. Because think about this too. We have this point of view from Moiraine. Yeah. The moment I love before that, she the leaps and tackles her, Moiraine fills herself to the brim with Sidar. That's our third I think that's one of our only three points from night from Moiraine at this point, right? If I'm not mistaken. We got one from Moiraine in the Great Hunt. We got one from Moiraine mm. in the Shadow Rising. I uh think. we got we got multiple from Moiraine in the Great Hunt. Multiple from Moiraine in the Great we, Hunt. So we get Moiraine in the final scene of Oh, Eye of the World. she's talking to Swan, that's right, at the beginning. Just just Yeah, one oh, at yeah. the end of Eye of the World, two in the Great Hunt. Yeah. That's right. Um but but think about this. Like Moiraine knows she's gonna tackle Lanfear. Why does she fill herself to the brim with side R before doing it? That's a, okay, that's a damn good point. That's a damn good point. Okay. Question answered. Like that that might have been like that extra little bit of the power that destabilized the yep. doorway. Okay. Enough. Sweet. Yeah. Uh um, Pat, you you were gonna add something to the the lore there? I saw you I just wanted to uh, it's not quite lore. But if we were going to move on from that, okay. I wanted to briefly mention that I think it was a mistake to kill Asmodian at the end of this book. Ooh. Ooh, this is like a That's writing a loaded style. statement. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, Let's talk. Here's my reasoning. I'm going to open another beer. Hold on a second. It's, <laughs> so as we're going through the oh, end shit. of this book, uh, Asmodian's there and he's doing stuff. You know, he's at the battle on the docks and all this stuff. And it's cool. And we start seeing a side of him that hasn't been there before. Um, and then he gets killed. And then he comes back. And then he just gets killed again. It's like, yeah. it's very anticlimactic. It's like, why why do it back to back like that? Why kill him fakely in the first place at all? If he's just going to die for real five minutes later. Or if you're going to kill him fakely. And he's going to die somewhere down the line that's also fine but well wh- why the proximity what sense does that's that a good point why revive him I, and kill him i think later? it's because it's for shock value because it's like okay these three characters just got killed and then resurrected and you're like oh okay phew and then boom oh nope actually they're not all safe but my point is the shock value would have been just the same if he didn't get killed by the lightning as if uh, he did well See, well, he he had to have the lightning happen in the Balefire. Yes. Because of the the severing of the Bond of the Horn, right? Right. And Avienda being the trigger. And he needed Avienda to be the trigger. If he just had Matt and Avienda die and get resurrected via Balefire, then it's just like, oh, well, you're, whatever, like, the characters are fine. Like, yeah. But by including Asmodian in that, whom he also knew was still going to die, 
it becomes more of a shock because like you think oh these characters are safe now and then one of them gets killed because you can't have only two of the three come back from the bale fire that would make sense i agree yeah so i i think like from a writer's perspective it, it makes sense how he engineered this because you can't just have it be like an easy cop out oh everybody who got killed by the lightning is alive now and is safe yeah you know and it helps punctuate the book. It, it ends... I mean, the the last line of the book is just like, wait, what? What just happened? You know? Yeah. And... I, I, I guess my I'm only saying that it would have been just as effective, I believe, as if he hadn't been yeah. killed by the Balefire already. We still believe by the him... We still believe him to be safe by the virtue of the fact that nothing's directly threatening them at the moment because that, that they're battle in the battle over what, I, still what i'm saying over robin's dead what i'm saying is that uh i think robert jordan wanted to make a point that just because somebody is brought back to life mm. via balefire mm. that like, like he didn't want balefire to become this like easy button where okay. the i win button yeah like yeah. <laughs> controls these it, it was mitigating narrative expectations around balefire where just because you're brought back via okay. Balefire doesn't mean, like, oh, you're good to go. Yeah, like, yeah you're, it yeah, could have been you're just not going to be safe point. forever. Sure. Yeah. And there are other narrative things that he adds yeah. to make Balefire less yeah, of an eyewitness. Especially win later on, yeah, uh, with the, the unraveling of the pattern and the Bale screams and all that. Um, but I, I like the way that went. Um, and that's not just me speaking as somebody who was involved in the hardcore theorization and and the uh you know the fan forums in the early 2000s and stuff like that uh i i also think it's notable that while this isn't confirmed uh it's likely asmodine was killed via balefire anyway yeah because yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was uh, dead before the scream finished reverberating through the room. Yeah, yeah, because there, there, there was a Robert Jordan quote about uh, both location and method of his death. Uh, you know, yeah, and and then on top of that, the the line like it hung in the air, yeah, like Im you? implying no, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, I so I I think that's that should kind of uh wrap it right yeah what uh, a great book what i have a great book i have two just uh um, final thoughts reactions that i want to get out of the way to things that we saw that things i hadn't considered before um number one in chapter 46 avienda says to rand i have even heard some of the some say that the aiel are now your dream and that when you wake from this life we will be no more when I heard that one this time around on the audiobook, I was kind of shocked because uh, I remember Rand, I remember now, Rand saying something very similar, spoilers, in A Memory of Light. I, just, I had not made that connection before, so I wanted to bring that up. And the second one that I want to bring up is uh, this is a big moment in Chapter 50 uh, for Elaine and Min. As, like, this is the first scene, I think, unless I miss my guess, where oh, like we they... have one of the trio admits to the other that they're in love with Rand. Yes. And then we also get, yes. as you really briefly mentioned earlier, we get more dramatic irony in this point. Oh, oh well, well, no, because Elaine, Elaine obviously talked to Avienda in the stone, and Avienda knows Elaine's like. Oh super, yeah. Super okay. But anyway, yeah. I, I get your point though. Yeah. Go I, on. And, and it, it, we got a little more dramatic irony in this point, like where, <laughs> where I think it was Elaine who says something along the lines, or thinks something along the lines of. Who was this third woman? He can't be meeting that many women with Avienda watching over him. You know, I love that <laughs> that little that little touch there. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, we still haven't we haven't gone over our, what you think. our three favorite scenes. Oh dang, you're right. Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, before we go into three favorite scenes, though, yeah. well, in fact, no, this is a good segue. Um, my kind of final thought uh, for this book is that uh, I feel like the fires of heaven doesn't get the love it deserves. Um, sure. Yeah. It agreed. It gets lost in in the sandwich between Lord of Chaos and the Shadow Rising where there are these iconic, I mean famous scenes and sequences with Roydion and and Golden Eyes at the end of Shadow Rising and then Dumai's Wells and you know and stuff in Lord of Chaos and people sort of forget about 
the fires of heaven or when they think about it they're like oh that was the traveling circus book like i didn't like that one very much and it's it's so much not the traveling circus book like there yeah. were there were what only like five or six chapters with the traveling circus you know yeah and in the 40s and this is a 56 yeah. chapter book and the climax of this it you know can throw down with the best of them there 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 are a few books that stand out as far as like climaxes in the wheel of time certainly the shadow risings up there as we talked about uh lord of chaos is up there winter's heart knife of dreams and i really think the fires of heaven belongs in that conversation you know it 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 was a pretty substantial basically the entire last third of this book was just non-stop awesome yeah and on that point my three favorite scenes are uh well two of the three were in the back half uh my my third favorite scene is the far snows okay. uh, i i loved just like the craziness i loved getting a little glimpse of like bringing sean chan back into it and i loved seeing avienda's walls come down like uh, that that scene when they're like lying together you know and she like reaches up and like strokes his hair and there's like the ice yeah caked in his hair you know and she says she and i love no seeing her finally recognize herself allow herself to to open up because i've talked about this before i'm a huge avienda fan and and it can be frustrating with her sometimes about how she represses her own instincts and her own emotions in favor of other people's expectations and this is a moment where avienda can just let herself be avienda and I love that. And the fact that she tried as hard as she can to get away from Randall Thor. She knows that he caught her he caught up to her and saved her life. She did everything in her humanly power and superhumanly power to get away yeah, from him. Yeah, I know. I was about to say I was like And <laughs> he he caught up and she she's able to that 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 shifted the burden. She was able to say, "All right, I I I, I can finally set that aside and I can accept this. I will run no more." As she said. Uh, that was right. perfect. Yeah, and then and so my second scene is Matt riding down and founding <laughs> the band of the Red Hand. <laughs> okay, like I I just it's so great, it's so amusing and so awesome at the same time. Like I I love that. Uh, and then my top scene of the book is is Rand's epic, Robin. Yeah, you know, like just yeah. like I said earlier, can't wait to see that on the TV show. Can't wait to get just an amazing battle scene there and and watch an actor put that kind of emotion out yeah. there so yeah. sweet pat three favorite scenes all right um number one is chronological order because i can't pick <laughs> okay uh, favorites um is matt's point of view after killing Kooladin. Nice. After the Immediately battle. following? Sure, sure. Immediately following. And this is in chronological order, so all three of yours yeah. are in the last third. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. No, actually, excuse me. That's that's not the... That's the one in the middle. The one... The first one ought to be Rand's fever dream thing during the battle. And then oh, they come to yeah. find him, and then he ends up falling from his horse. Right. And he yeah, wakes yeah. up, you know, right. like, and the last thing he remembers is Asmodian trying to heal him. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Wow, I hadn't uh, even considered that. That was that was awesome. Just it was, it was foggy and it was chilling at the same time. It was really cool. Mar and even Land kind of his was, walls uh, breaking down. Moraine, he's bleeding yeah. badly. Yeah. I, it was also like a really cool moment uh, for Asmodian, where we see yeah. like just his desperation, where he's got nothing. Like the guy's yeah. not a healer. He's he's got no power, but he he's like, oh man, like yeah. uh Dang yeah. it! <laughs> and Rand wonders. Rand's like, I, I probably would have died had Asmodian not, yeah, ha added that little trickle. How crazy! And is that, that might go something towards answering your question from the last podcast. And what is it that everybody sees about Asmodian? Why do they pity him so much? I, I mean, I still think like that these. was an utterly oh, selfish yeah. act. Especially, but... we get a whole point about Asmodian after the fact after he's resurrected, where he thinks about it. That's a good thing. How I haven't changed or anything. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In any case, uh, third year. Yeah. You're, yeah. Third and final would be Rand reading Moraine's letter after mm. the Landfair confrontation. Just mm. 
Much agreed. Oh, what a crushing scene. Much agreed. Yeah. yeah. Well, for Rand as well as me. Oh, for yeah. oh, I love it. Every time I get into All it, right. it's hard to read, but it's it's amazing. Uh, All right, Rob, hit us. So my three favorite scenes. Um, number one is something that I'm really glad that Drew brought up earlier, and you'll hear me if you go back and listen to it. I got really excited. One would say inordinately excited during uh, Drew's uh, discussion of it. Um, Galad fighting through the riots of yeah, Dragonsworn yeah. to secure the ship, and how it's Jordan describes like the tide, like the, like breaking waves over like a rock, and he's just there, and he just he greets the oncoming rush like he's attending a dance. I was just like, oh my god, it, th- that scene was written so well, like the utter confidence. Yeah, Galad was like, like he's just standing badass. there. Doesn't even bother drawing his sword until they're on yeah. top of him. Yeah. And he's just like, whoop, yeah. dead, 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 you know? <laughs> Number two is something that Pat just brought up, Rand uh, reading Warren's letter. So, oh, so, really? okay. so cool. crushing to read, but so quaint for both of those characters. And my third is literally, I, I think what is literally the last scene of the book. And it's this moment after uh, Rand meets Davram Bashir for the first time. And he finds out what Bashir is doing. And by the way, the 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 what this book sets up for the next one, how a yes, he he meets Davram Bashir, but we also get the reveal from Rand that he has this amnesty for men who can channel. Just mm-hmm. oh, yeah. perfect. So stoked to begin Lord of Chaos. But what I'm talking about in this, there's one moment in this particular scene where I just got chills, and I will get chills every single time I ever read it. And it's when Davran Bashir explains to Rand why he's there. Rand tells him, you cannot have Mazrum Taim. I have this amnesty. And he manages somehow, uh, probably involving his effect as a Tavirin, you know, Bashir says, okay, well, you now have my 9,000 Saldean heavy cavalry. Light and cavalry. Light cavalry. Oh, I thought it was heavy cavalry. I thought all Saldean were. Okay. Very much light. Okay, sorry. That's a like big plot point, actually. Cool. Okay, so 9,000 Saldean cavalry. And... After having just defeated, Rand has this moment where he kind of like I don't I don't know sure if he leans back, but he looks into his wine glass, and he, like this is like he's killed Ravine, he's saved Matt and Avienda, uh, and he just acquired nine thousand Saldean horse, and he's perhaps you know acquiring the allegiance of the Saldeans as well. And in response to this, he just swirls the glass. He just looks down in it and he swirls it and he, and he contemplates. I just that moment is so chilling to me to read because you you get this I don't know this Randall Thor really really starts to shine more and more as we go through this series and that moment really did it for me I just I loved it thought it was that's perfect. awesome like I I've like that's not a normal scene I I like that you that fixated moment fixated on something just that... the swirling of the glass that was yeah totally <clears throat> perfect that's it's a awesome. very good scene yeah I always look forward to it. Yeah, so that's well, it. Uh, are you going to conquer the world with your ideal <laughs> and army of men who can channel? Ran. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> if I need to, I'll greet any any ruler as an ally. That'll take me. But so, uh, on that note, shall we head into the final yes, draft? Let's. I'll start off because I got a shitty choice. I Ooh, I have a, oh, I have a bit to complain see. about today. Um, I was in this in in the the liquor store recently. And uh, for, for future context, we're recording this episode on October 6th. Uh, it's probably not going to come out, I think, until the first week of November. But it's yeah, tis the bit. season right now that uh, pumpkin-flavored things are yeah. are really uh, into our lives. Yeah, and me. I was just oh, yeah. I was buying a little Mickey of, of whiskey. It was special old. And I saw this as like one of those impulse buy baskets at the front near the register. And this was – it's an orange can, as you can see. This is a pumpkin ale. Which I zeroed in on immediately. I decided to embrace my inner white girl and give it a shot. Um, <laughs> this here Elaine is. Elaine would be so proud of you. <laughs> yeah, she would. Yeah. Elaine would wear Uggs, wouldn't she? She absolutely would. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm... She wouldn't. <laughs> she's way, yeah, she's way, way too, too rich for that. For that. Yeah, okay. But she would drink pumpkin spice lattes. But she would, yeah. Um, this is from Lake of Bays Brewing Company. And this is a pumpkin ale uh, called. It's just called Pumpkin Ale. <laughs> Look at All it. Right. That yeah. Wow. Uh, it's a six percent flavored strong beer. And if I were to des- to describe the taste of this beer, I would say it would be like, you know, the smell of hay, with hay. Like you sure. got a, a big yeah. handful of really old dry hay, yeah, that yeah. dusty smell. It's not really. It's like an anti smell. And then you throw it in the glass and you mix it with a bunch of hot water and then you piss in that water. That would be what this <laughs> tastes like. I think it was disgusting. So, 
It and was you, terrible, and, yeah. And then, and then yeah. you refrigerated it because it was refrigerated, but it was terrible, and I would absolutely not recommend I wasn't expecting anything great out of a pumpkin ale. And the world um, heaves a collective And it didn't let me down. Disbelief. It did. Didn't. Did. <laughs> yeah, no. I, yeah. I'll tell you, there there are some really good pumpkin beers out there. Really? But they are few and far between, and most pumpkin beers are pretty terrible. <laughs> so. I, I, I fully believe it. Okay, what are you guys yeah. drinking? Well, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm back to an old standard. Um, Sippin' Pretty is the name of my beer. It's a fruited sour from Odell's. Uh, it's very nice, very nice beer. It pops a lot in your mouth. Um, they added a Himalayan pink sea salt to this beer. Himalayan which, pink sea salt. Which is part of the reason why it has that. As opposed that to the Himalayan green very, sea salt, that shit. It has a very pale that. pinkish color to the beer. Really? Um, but it's very refreshing, very good. Um, is it? Do they call it a goza? On the... uh, I do not believe so. Interesting, okay. Um, but it's it's always quite refreshing and uh, just a solid choice. And then I, Drew was kind enough to give me one of his beers too, which he will explain to you right now. Oh I will. crap! With his Here we go. Of dropping of hints before. Oh, uh, oh uh, no! Did he really add a subliminal so, line to this again? Recall, <laughs> it's happened. Oh, shit. <laughs> if you will recall, the very first Fires of Heaven episode, I brought in Wolf's a wedding, beer dedicated to Perrin. Uh, yes. okay. getting laid called Wolf's Wedding and the second episode I brought in a beer dedicated to Rand getting laid Oh, snowed in shit. I see where this is going <laughs> and this time I brought in a beer dedicated to Matt and his main squeeze in this book <laughs> I like what you did there specifically to their final scene Oh, which of course occurs in this section this is an American <laughs> Blonde Ale from Melvin Brewing Company in Wyoming. It is uh, brewed with clover honey, and it is very tasty. Very uh, very light, crisp, a little sweet on the finish. It is called Killer Bees. No! 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 No, it is... No, no! No, it's not fucking called that. No, it's not. Show me... Hold on, pick up the headset. Show me the fucking label. You son of a bitch. What? Can the... confirm. <laughs> is he shitting it's... me? No, Pat, it's is unbelievable, he me? isn't it? It's unbelievable. For Ugh. like the final one of Lord of Chaos, he's going to somehow pull out a beer that's like shredded meat. <laughs> it's just going to be called that... Doom Eyes Wells. That's... <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I was going to make that same fucking joke. It's going to be something along the lines of Doom Eyes Wells no, or it, I will... Bloody Spears. As far as or... I'm aware, there is no beer called Doom Eyes Wells, but I will say there there is a, a book on our future list that I traded for a beer uh, from friggin' like North Carolina. That is straight up, the beer is called the title of the book, and it is inspired by this book, and the label on it is, like, the main character of this book. So, that's <laughs> okay. sitting in my fridge, waiting to get dropped on you. <laughs> oh, Hell my God. Yeah. But, oh, wait till we get to the end of yeah, A Memory I, of Light, and Drew busts out a brew called Three Become One. Like, Jesus. Ooh. <laughs> or off shaitan like i can't even like how do you <laughs> how do you do this well i'll tell you i do have a beer already for um uh towers of midnight i have oh, that shit. lined up sitting in my uh in yeah. fact i have two uh i think we're planning on doing three parts for towers of midnight and i probably oh, maybe, maybe we're only doing two but i have uh i have beers i have two beers already lined up in my fridge for towers of midnight because uh <laughs> i am prepared i am wow. prepared Illidan Damn. nods his silent approval. Color me a bright. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good. Uh... <laughs> for all you, for all you, like, three people out there who'll get that reference. Oh, three. Oh, I Pat. hope it's more than that. Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> <laughs> gonna, gonna go out on a limb and say a lot of people who uh, read fantasy books and listen to fantasy podcasts probably play World of Warcraft. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I can only hope. We'll give you that idea. playing classic. Hit me up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Is your, do you have a Wheel of Time name on WoW? No, but there is a guild on our server called Shen'on Kalhar. 
That is fair. I, I absolutely I, I believe made that. sure to ask the guildmaster, like, that is what I think it is, right? And he's like, yep, totally. Okay. Said, awesome. Great. What would you have said if they said, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> there was a, there was a character tune named, uh, <laughs> named Abara, who was a warrior and a blacksmith. Which I thought was also it's like okay, nice. okay, nice. well done. Yeah. I see what and I'll there. say I'll add to that and say in the days of you know the, the good old days, the shining golden days of Diablo two, Lord of Destruction online, mm, all of my characters, every goddamn one of them was named after one of the Forsaken. I had Semirog, I had nice, wow, Aginor, I had Rod. A lot of them I had, are very fitting, uh, yes. Aren't they? But yeah, you know, of course, you never get the originals, demons. so you always have to add <laughs> yeah. like a couple of. You can't. You, there's demons Characters. in Diablo and the Wheel of Time that share the same name. Yeah, you can kill Asmodeus with Asmodian. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> oh, you could actually, couldn't you? Yeah. And, um, uh, Bilal. Yeah, Bilal. Yeah, Bilal. As, as Bale, yeah. Uh, oh, it's it, he's called Bale in the. Yeah, B A A L. Oh. Yeah, Bale. Oh, Ball. Oh, because because there's also a Bilal. Oh, Ball a, sounds yes, really cool. Yes, and then there's cool. Bilal as well. Yeah, yeah. excuse me. Because there's Baalzaman is Ball. And right, then okay. Belial is so the law. Three, yeah, direct links. Uh, well, right well there. is there not Samael as well? Um, in because Samael's a demon. Lord of Samael Chaos is a demon. Or okay, Lord of not, Chaos in and uh, he's not one of the double two Lord of Destruction. Or the lesser evils, oh, okay, okay. As far as I know, gotcha. Well, yeah, because I, I I just know that uh, many of the Forsaken are named after uh, apocryphal yeah uh, demons. Cor- demons. Yes, that's yeah. definitely, if not all of them. But on that note, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this has been episode thirty-nine of the Inking Out Loud podcast. Yeah, uh, next up, we are going to be covering Warrior of the Altai, which is the new old Robert Jordan book. Uh, as Rob said, we're recording this on October sixth. This book comes out on October eighth. Uh, because of that, we're going to try to read the whole book and record all in one go next sunday but if we uh you know if we just have too much to talk about which is a distinct possibility uh we may split it into two episodes but uh yeah we're we're gonna be covering warrior and i will say right now we are planning on having a pretty special guest on Mm -hmm. for, for that book uh so definitely tune in for those episodes i hope there's an audiobook oh my god i hope there's an audiobook because I'm going to do like 62 hours oh, before I'm we sure get there will be an so. audiobook. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, and on that note, if you want to tune in and check out uh, our discussion on the newest Robert Jordan material that comes out with, again, uh, a pretty cool guest, uh, check out our Patreon. Uh, we have a couple of tiers where you can get early access to our episodes. We have stuff uh you know we have our our monthly newsletter you can recommend books for us to read things like that and all of this patreon money right now is going straight to pat right here and danny uh our artist she does all those super cool thumbnails that you're seeing with the ink blot art um you know we're we're not here to quit our day jobs and make a living off this We, we just want to put out fun content for all you guys and Unfortunately, that does come with some expenses, so if you appreciate what we're doing, uh, consider checking out our Patreon. But I am here to quit my day job, so definitely <laughs> check out the Patreon. Yeah, that, those previous 62 hours I mentioned were my day job. It's going to make me. It's gonna make it difficult for me to finish Warrior Del Tide, but if there's an audiobook, I'll be able to fly through that in a couple of days. Apologies, continue. Please. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as always, I'm your host, Drew McCaffrey. With me is my co-host, Rob Santos. Word. And our special guest, Patrick McCaffrey. I'll be gone, but not forgotten. And we will catch you next time. Bye, everybody.